I told him, I told him, what are you waiting for? Go on, go on, you dumb, you dumb sweet. I told him that. But he's got to be old money himself, don't he? Yeah, too good to take orders from some old sergeant. So you got to stick around and get himself? Look, Sarge. We got the gun position. Yeah, we was really bobbing and weaving in there. The old fast break, just like a well-oiled machine. Oh, save it, Coach. Save it till the Northeast Iowa Conference after the war. Gosh, look, we know how you feel, Spence. We all yelled, too. What are you going to do about a guy like that? Yeah, yeah, what did you yell at him? Be a hero, Olsen? Save the good old Sarge, huh? Where's Olsen? Where's Olsen? He ought to be here. He ought to be drinking that wine. He ought to be over in the corner, writing that letter to that girl is. Like, what's her name? Helga. Yeah. Yeah, that, that Helga up in whatever the name of that dumb, sweet town is. All about the cows he was going to own. And the war bonds they were saving. Yeah. And keep a lookout for a, for a barn, a good tight barn to keep the cattle dry. Wilson ain't sleeping very dry tonight, is he? Did you bring him in? Not yet, Spence. We couldn't get to him yet. He ought to be here. If he was here. He'd be out there in his place, Sarge. So what? What got into him anyway? Why'd he come after me like that? I told him, I told him, go on, go on. We had your boat covered. We yeah. thought he'd get you back over that ridge. Yeah, you guys. You guys, you thought. Yeah. Well, I thought too. I thought I had me a squad. The best damn squad in the army. How long we've been together anyway? North Africa, Sicily, Italy, and now this. A lot of fights. And a lot of fun. Yeah, remember that town in Italy? That Ooh, little old yeah, place on the side of the mountain there? there. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that old man with the five. Five oh, and that of the full of vino. Oh, oh, <laughs> I thought I had me a, a squad. But all I got is a bunch of bunch of dumb, crummy friends who think they all gotta be heroes. <sighs> and the best one of them all is lying outside there on a hill with a name nobody can pronounce. A hell of a long ways from Minnesota. Hey, the papers ever say anything about this? How it is down here where there ain't much to a war except mud and dirt? And that... And the guy's friends. Friends, he said. Uh, one crummy bullet in the leg and the guy's psycho. Yeah, Gallucci. First nice word he said since he got the last stripe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, that's the last.
Did any of it get in the papers? About a kind of magic I call comradeship. I don't know, but as a war correspondent, which is a fancy name for a reporter whose beat is the battlefield instead of the courthouse or the police station, as a war correspondent, I tried to write about it back there during the Second World War. A lot of us tried. A bunch of nice guys named Ernie Pyle and Jack Singer and many others died trying. But all of us saw it there and later on in Korea. This magic I'm talking about. Anybody who's ever been close to American soldiers fighting overseas has felt it. I saw it that night in 1944 in the rubble of a farmhouse somewhere in Europe. A kind of bond that tied together a bunch of guys and made them into a fighting unit. The magic of comradeship among a New York cop, a high school coach from Iowa, an insurance salesman from California, a Texas haberdasher, and a dairy farmer from Minnesota. Is magic too strong a word? Well, I don't think so. And I've seen it at work aboard ships of the Navy and in the cramped quarters of a bomber. I've seen it in remote and lonely spots of the earth where the enemies are monotony and boredom. I saw it in World War II and I saw it in Korea. I know men who have told me about it in the First World War and the Spanish-American War. They held me spellbound with their stories when I was a kid. The magic of comradeship. I suppose it takes all sorts of magic to win a war. The magic of production. The magic of technical skills. The magic of leadership. The magic of comradeship. And every time I saw it in battle, it seemed to me it would be a tragic thing if we lost it when the war ended. In fact, I used to wonder what would happen to these men after the war. Where would they go? Oh, I suppose the lucky ones would go back to their hometowns and their jobs and wives and girls and pick things up just as before. And in a way, that was wonderful. But also, in a way, it would be too bad. Too bad if the magic of comradeship which had conquered Hitler and Mussolini and Hirohito, were to be lost to us forever. For there would, I knew, be enemies that had to be fought in time of peace as well as war. I guess it's a question that has nagged at the minds of a lot of guys. Where did it all go? What happened to the unity, that feeling of belonging to a team, of standing up to the enemy alongside a guy who would, oh, he'd bum your last cigarette, swipe your girl, brag about Texas or Brooklyn or Hannibal, Missouri, crack lousy jokes, whistle off key, and save your life. Well, I've been on the trail of an answer, and I think I've found it. The magic of comradeship is still working in this country of ours, still fighting her enemies, enemies which are doubly dangerous because they are subtle and intangible and hard to identify. The trail started for me on a street corner, not far from this office. It wasn't an unusual thing for New York City. A parade. But what a parade. I guess everyone loves parades, but this one particularly gave me a kick because of its timing. Here the veterans of foreign wars had taken May Day, which the commies had been trying for years to make their own special holiday, and turned it into the exact opposite, a loyalty day on which Americans of every kind stepped out to the music of a band to, to show their love for the kind of freedom we have. It seemed to me that 
There was one way the VFW had applied the magic of comradeship in peacetime by calmly bouncing the communists out of their favorite propaganda spot. But parades alone don't beat enemies. And I thought of some of the enemies we have in America today. The enemy of juvenile delinquency, weakening the fabric of our society, eroding our most precious resource, our young men and women. The enemy of apathy toward our political problems, leaving the door open for the grafter, the subversive, the traitor, the tool of pressure groups, the crook, the incompetent, the enemy of neglect of our veterans, which undercuts the pride with which young men wear the uniform of their country. This is the cruel enemy which keeps disabled veterans from proving that they can fill useful jobs in business and industry. Neglect that punishes children because their fathers served their country. The enemy of smugness which lets our national defenses dwindle away, which discourages young Americans from seeking careers in our armed forces, which weakens our reserve components in our National Guard. Those are the enemies, the enemies within America, eating away at our national strength, weakening our resistance to communism. How, I wondered, could the magic of comradeship that won fighting wars be brought to bear against these enemies? What is the VFW doing to fight these enemies? The enemy of juvenile delinquency. Well, the National Marble Tournament is one of the ways. Boys from every state in the Union, from every walk of life, gather together to test their hard-learned skills in the healthy, open competition that is the heritage of every American youth. And VFW posts throughout the country carry on thousands of projects to provide such recreational opportunities. The Marble Tournament, because it is unique, is perhaps the best known. It's serious business, but it's fun, too. No room here for pompous statements about combating juvenile delinquency. But that's the inevitable byproduct of the fun. And the same thing goes for the baseball team sponsored by VFW Posts for Boys in the Teenage Class. To them, the national tournament is just as important as any World Series. And from these teams may come the big leaguers of tomorrow. Boys stay out of trouble when they're trying to improve their batting averages. Who doesn't thrill to the music of a drum and bugle corps? Or a brass band, whether in a parade or competition? And the music is somehow sweeter when it's being made by boys and girls who are learning to express themselves in worthwhile ways. Boy Scout troops, youth clubs, all these and scores of other projects sponsored or inspired by the VFW prove that the magic of comradeship can work to provide America with a happy, vigorous generation of youngsters to keep America strong, to guard against the decay of delinquency. You know, next I wondered, how about the enemy of apathy, that don't care attitude of the citizen who, oh, he can't be bothered to vote, who falls into the trap of figuring, ah, what's the use? What can one man do? One man, an individual citizen, can do much in our republic. But he can do far more when he applies the magic of comradeship by associating himself with others to achieve his goals. The Veterans of Foreign Wars is non-political. Its members belong to all parties, but it realizes that democracy can function only when the voters make their opinions felt at the polls. So it is that posts across the land turn out to see that every eligible voter is registered, gets out to vote on election day. 
This is an asset to any community. But a swimming pool like this doesn't just happen. It's the product of work and planning, weeks and months of planning. And in town after town, you'll find the VFW behind swimming pools, playgrounds, new schools. Helping a community's dreams come true is part of the magic of comradeship. One of the weapons with which it fights the enemy of citizen apathy. My answer was beginning to take shape now. I could see how the VFW was making its contribution to the battle against our peacetime enemies. But one of the most insidious enemies was still unaccounted for. The enemy of neglect of our men who have served their country. Just because I got unlucky and got a hand blown off, doesn't mean I think the world owes me a living. But when the VFW Post helped me land this job without me even asking, well, that's something. Maybe it's because the guys are all overseas vets themselves. Helps them understand the problems of a guy like me. I figure helping a guy to be, well, self-supporting is much different than pulling a guy out of the line of fire in the war. Anyway, sure as they haven't forgotten. I'm glad I'm a member of VFW. Wait a second. I'm the service officer of our post, and what that vet has said is true. But it goes beyond that. We figure that anybody with an honorable discharge has earned the right to get help whenever he needs it. Now, say a man is disabled. Well, we'll help him prove if it was service incurred or not. And even if it wasn't service incurred, we'll work with the VA to get him taken care of. Or maybe it's financial aid he needs. Well, that's what our relief fund is for. You see, when a veteran's in trouble, through no fault of his own, our idea is to do whatever has to be done to get him and his family back on their feet. Men in veterans' hospitals know the VFW and the ladies of its auxiliary as good friends, always at hand to brighten the long days of convalescence. The VFW is there to give aid to the families of these men, to show in a thousand ways, little and big, that America does not forget those who have sacrificed for her. It keeps an experienced eye on legislation that affects the rights of disabled veterans. If one thing symbolizes the VFW's continuing comradeship with the disabled vet, it is the Buddy Poppy, proudly made by hands that have fought for their country, proudly and gratefully worn by Americans everywhere. The money raised by the Buddy Poppy sales is used by VFW posts for assistance to needy or disabled veterans or their families. Part of the Buddy Poppy funds go to a project particularly close to the hearts of the members of the VFW, the VFW National Home at Eaton Rapids, Michigan, where children whose fathers are dead or totally disabled find a home. The magic of comradeship fights the enemy of neglect. For the national home is more than just a modern institution providing the children with the finest in physical care, education, and recreation. It is a real home where these children from every corner of the United States are integrated into a normal family life. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest, our morning joy, our evening rest, and with this daily bread and part, strength and love to every heart, amen. This is one other way the VFW can pay a small part of the country's debt to those comrades who have given their lives on the battlefield. On this, the VFW creed is based. 
honor the dead by helping the living. And what about the final enemy? That smugness that could let our defenses crumble, thus inviting the horrors of another war. I learned that the VFW's attack on this enemy is as varied as the complexity of the problem requires. An America that is strong in the weapons of war and strong in the moral fiber of its citizens has always been the goal of the VFW. Something as simple as this, encouraging observance of our patriotic holidays, is a part of the VFW's fight against our enemies. So is something as complicated as working to inform the public on the necessity of maintaining our armed forces, enlisting support for intelligent defense legislation. It can be something as friendly as running a canteen for servicemen or as grim as the continuing battle to expose and bring to trial those who seek to overthrow our government as part of foreign conspiracies. It can be as monotonous as long hours of civil defense work, or as thrilling as a drum and bugle corps. But whatever the work, it's part of the contribution being made by the veterans of foreign wars in the battle against the unseen enemies of our country. It's part of an unending battle begun by a handful of veterans of the Spanish-American War. Carried on by the doughboys of World War I. And the millions of American fighting men of World War II and of the Korean campaign. It's based on the conception that men who have served under arms on foreign duty can and must band together to help their comrades, their country, and their communities. In great cities and small towns throughout America, the VFW Post stands for all that is best in fellowship and service. To these posts, Reporter Bob Considine turned to seek an answer to his question. He saw the VFW at work and at play. For fun that is shared is as vital a part of comradeship as is the sharing of work. VFW families are brought into the magic bond through social activities as well as through community service. in passing. We might well wonder how long this nation's unseen enemies could survive if all American families had this sort of fun together. Well, that's a little of what I saw when I started digging into the VFW story. I'm not through yet, but I've gone far enough to learn this much. The answers to my questions are, well, they're just about what I should have expected back there in World War II when I saw the things that comradeship could accomplish, I should have known that anything as vigorous as that was in wartime certainly wouldn't die just because the guns fell silent. I should have known this magic bond we call comradeship would just have to go on as strong as ever. Oh, most of the faces I've seen back home here are different, but I know them. I've seen them before. In the presence of Almighty God, in the presence of Almighty God, and the members of this order here assembled, and the members of this order here assembled, I, I, William B. do of my own free will and accord, do of my own free will and accord, solemnly promise and declare that. Solemnly promise and declare that. I've seen them, I've known them overseas. Their names may be different, they may even be a different generation from the guys I wrote about, because the VFW has its roots very deep in the history of our wars. But they're the faces of men who mean it when they say, I will bear true allegiance to the government of the United States of America. To 
And I will always be loyal there too. Whoever they are, wherever they are, I know them and their devotion to their country and to each other. I promise and pledge. All I promise and pledge. Upon the honor of a true comrade. Upon the honor of a true comrade. And a citizen of our great republic. And a citizen of our great republic. This is one reporter's opinion. But I think you can bank on it. The men who belong to the veterans of foreign wars are going to see to it that the magic bond of comradeship that has carried America to victory on the battlefield will continue to keep her strong and prosperous in time of peace. Tender ties formed amid the privations and dangers of war be drawn closer by our fellowship.